Welcome to Blueprint IoT. In this video, we will talk about TTL and CMOS. Before we get started, let's clarify what does TTL means. So TTL stands for Transistor Transistor Logic. And in case you're wondering why Transistor is in there twice, we need to go one step back and talk about the previous technology, which was DTL. So DTL was basically diode transistor logic. So there were two components involved, the diode and the transistor, and the diode was basically there to do the logic, it was the brain of the whole thing, to interpret some signals and basically translate them into, is it, should, is it supposed to be a high or is it supposed to be a low? And then there was a transistor to amplify the signal to ensure that you have a straight and a very clear high signal or low signal. And that brings us already to the core of what TTL is or what DTL was and what CMOS is as well. It's basically at the core of digital communication. As you know, digital communication will be always either a high or a low signal. In case you're not familiar with the concept of logic levels, high and lows, please check out my previous video about logic levels to make sure you're prepared of what's coming. So the TTL and the DTL and also the CMOS are basically ways how to create those highs and lows uh, on a technical level, on a very like on a component level inside a microcontroller or even inside just a small logic controller. So while DTL used the diode for the logic part and a transistor to amplify the signal to have a proper high or proper low, the TTL was transitioning to also using transistors for the logic part, using several transistors to build NAND gates and using NAND gates to build logic gates. So as we clarified what it is for, let's try to move on to the comparison of TTL and CMOS and how you can actually apply this in your application. So while DTL is basically not used at all anymore, TTL and CMOS are still around. TTL is the older one, CMOS is the little bit of a newer one, and the both are still used in different use cases and different cost concerns for those use cases. But let's take a quick look on CMOS first before we compare the two of them. So CMOS is an abbreviation as well, and it means complementary metal oxide semiconductor. So while the metal oxide is pretty clear, it's indicating that we're using a MOSFET, so a metal oxide transistor, so that's only specifying which type of transistor is used. And obviously the question is what was used with TTL. TTL used BJTs like the traditional kind of transistor. While we keep that in mind for the comparison later on, while this has major implications of the performance of the two, Let's move on with the S, the semiconductor, that's basically just indicating that it's like a highly integrated thing. So everything is done on one semiconductor and the whole CMOS basically logic is on, on one semiconductor, not like individual transistors connected to each other. Obviously, that's the standard these days. It leaves us with only one question. What does the complementary tries to indicate here? So as you may know, there are P-type and N-type MOSFETs or P-channel and N-channel MOSFETs. And what the complementary means that we're using a p-type mosfet a p-channel mosfet to create the low and we're using an n-channel mosfet to create the high signal so two transistors here in use two mosfets in use two different types of mosfets in use to basically conduct in the low scenario or conduct in the high scenario so for each logic level the low or the high a different type of mosfet is used the p and the n-type one for each of the logic states. Having the basics clarified, let's try to compare them a little bit. So while the TTL is using a BJT transistor, this one is engaged by a current, the base current. The CMOS is using a MOSFET, which is triggered with a voltage. So this has huge implications on the power consumption. Triggering something with a current means there is a current flowing, so this means there's energy consumption triggering something with a voltage, so just with a field, this is much more energy efficient. There is no current flowing, so there is no significant energy consumption despite some leak. So to hold the logic level, no matter if it's a high or a low, is very energy efficient with the CMOS, while the TTL will have continuous energy consumption. Besides that, there is another big advantage of the CMOS. It's something called rail to rail. This means that you can capitalize on your supply voltage almost completely. So when you have a low 
the CMOS goes really down to basically zero volts and the high will basically go up all the way to the supply voltage. So let's assume five volts. So you would have the high at five volts and the low at zero volts. The TTL on the other hand cannot do this rail to rail. So it can't go all the way up, especially to the supply voltage. Reason being is that you have a voltage drop across the transistors. So there you will lose some voltage. So you will never reach the five volts as an output signal if you're supplying with five volts. And this simply comes with a high logic level, which sits below the supply voltage. So while talking about supply voltage and actual logic levels, let's move on and compare the logic levels of the CMOS and the TTL because that's what will affect your application the most when you're trying to match a CMOS and a TTL component and you want them to communicate to each other. So over here in TTL land, we have, let's say, a supply voltage of 5 volts and that's basically always the given for the standard TTL, also for the standard CMOS. I don't want to get here into the details. There are several, like really countless subtypes of TTL and countless even more subtypes of CMOS. So I will here refer to the standard ones, to the default ones. You need to check this in detail, which standard you're actually using with your component. So let's assume we have two devices here. The one is the sender device and the one is the receiver device. The receiver device over here will interpret everything between 0 and 0 0.8 volt as a low. So everything up to 0 0.8 volt will be still interpreted as a low signal. On the other hand, the high signal will be everything from 5 volt down to 2 volts. So even when you're only at like 3.3 volt or something, you can still interpret this as a high signal. Everything in between will be interpreted as undefined and will cause you a lot of trouble with your communication. One way to avoid ending up in this undefined area and causing trouble in communications is using pull up and pull down resistors. So if you want to learn more about this topic, make sure to check out the video about it. Over on the other side, on the sender side, the sender will always send something between 0 and 0 0.4 volts as the low signal and something between 5 and 2.4 volts as the high signal. We already learned that you can't really go to the full supply voltage due to the voltage drop across the transistor, but that's let's say the band within you would send the high signal. Again, everything in between is undefined or wouldn't be used. Having those two bands side to side, we can check out what would happen in the edge cases. So zero volt, no problem. Everything is interpreted as a low. It was meant as a low. It will be interpreted as a low. Still at the other edge, 0.4 volt will still land in the middle of the low interpretation. So no matter which edge we go to, we will always end up interpreting clearly. So by design, the TTL logic leaves us with some safety margin here. On the other spectrum, at 5 volts, no worries, full 5 volt will be fully interpreted as a high. 2.4 volts will be above the 2 volt threshold, so it will be still interpreted as a high. Nevertheless, the high can bring us a little bit into trouble here. If you have a really long wire or cable in place and you have a significant voltage drop, maybe some bad soldering in between or some connectors, some corroded connectors, whatever, you could experience a voltage drop and then you're getting already kind of close into the two volt threshold. But by design and if you have proper wiring, you have no trouble with talking from one device to another. Over on the other side in CMOS land, it's a similar setup. We will have the receiver again here in the middle and the sender here on the right hand side. So the receiver will interpret it everything up to 1.5 volts as a low and everything between 5 volts and down to 3.5 volts as a high. Everything in between, same logic, will be undefined and will cause trouble in your communication. The sender itself will always send up to 0.5 volt in case he wants to communicate a low and anything between 5 volts and 4.4 volts as a high. Everything in between, basically not used and undefined. Trying to match it again to the spectrum of the receiver, we can see that it's all matching, all landing in the green area. And the safety margin here is even bigger. We have 1 volt of safety margin versus 0 0.4 volt in the TTL land. And on the top end, we have also a bigger safety margin here. So we have 0 0.9 volt basically of safety margin on the high end of CMOS 
and in the TTL land at the same time we have only 0.4 volt of safety margin. So CMOS is already by design a little bit of more of a robust setup in terms of the voltage bands. So while those are interesting differences between TTL and CMOS in terms of the voltage bands, the interesting bit is what would happen if you would try to communicate from a TTL to a CMOS device or from a CMOS to the TTL device. Because a high is still a high and a low is a low, so from a digital communication point of view it's basically the same, but the voltage bands can cause trouble. So assuming that our CMOS wants to communicate to a TTL, the low seems no problem, obviously on the edge, on the lower edge, no problem at all. On the higher edge, also no problem, 0.5 max, 0.8 is what's possible to interpret it as a low. So we still have some safety margin, only 0.3 volts, but that shouldn't be a problem. At the high end, at 5 volts, no problem at all. Also at the lower edge, 4.4 volts, we are way into the high band of TTL. So the safety margin is actually incredibly big, the biggest one we could experience here with 2.4 volts of safety margin. So communicating from CMOS to TTL, again talking about the standard types and not about any of the subtypes, this is actually totally safe and no problem at all, shouldn't be any issue in your communication. But what's about talking from a TTL to a CMOS? On the lower edge case, of course, no problem at all. Also on the higher edge of the low 0.4 volt, we are way into the low band here. On the high end, 5 volts, of course, also no problem. But there we go with the problem. The lower edge of TTL, 2.4 volts. And as we learned, it's much more likely to be on the lower edge compared to the higher edge as we have the voltage drop across the transistor, the BJT transistor. So it's quite likely that we end up in the middle of the undefined area of the CMOS. Even though TTL will not communicate by default right on the lower edge of 2.4 volts, but it will definitely also not communicate on the high edge of 5 volts. So it will be something in between, depending on the transistors used and so on, and also then adding up a certain voltage drop across the wiring, across the cables or connectors, solderings, whatever, you can imagine that it's quite likely that you hit the undefined area. So communicating from a TTL to a CMOS can work, but it's quite unlikely or let's say it's quite probable that you will encounter some problems on the way. So if you wanted to communicate from TTL to CMOS, make sure that you're using a CMOS type that is compatible to TTL or alternatively use a translator basically. So a converter that will convert your TTL signal or logic into a CMOS or vice versa, a CMOS into a TTL. So then you're on the safe side or in best case, obviously use two devices, two components that are both using TTL or both using CMOS. So those are basically all the basics that you need to know to understand what you need to look for, what you need to keep an eye on for your own application. I hope you liked it. If any further questions or you think I forgot some important stuff about TTL and CMOS, please let me know down in the comments. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Please consider to subscribe and see you next time.